international and other pen centres across the world campaign for imprisoned writers all, all over the globe. We promote literature and literary culture, freedom to write and the importance of the written word in all its forms. But we also come here today um, to um, mark um, and commemorate um, writers that have um, that are continue to be in prison, that have died in prison, um, and we sit here um, at this event in solidarity with writers who are in prison, and we call for justice and freedom for those prisoners. And today we specifically focus on Turkey and four imprisoned writers in Turkey. I'd like to draw your attention to one of the tiles on your screens that holds the empty chair. This chair acts as a reminder of the writer's forced, forced absence and separation from colleagues, family and community, including the community of writers. By showing, oh, We can still hear you, Jane. Sorry, has that? No, I know you can still hear me. But my my document, my document, um, is not, is gone. Sorry, you're just going to. Bear I'll end, with me. Yep. Will I end the screen share? Um, if you could remove the empty chair, please. No, I still haven't got my document. Hold on. This is not one of the ones that are printed off. Um, and it's not column mode. Would you like me to say a few words on behalf of Wales, Pen Cymru now, uh, Jane, uh, while you well, find... And, and I'll go in search of my document. Thank you. Okay, great. Diolch um, yn iawn. My name is Eileen Hab Griffith jones I'm um, Professor at University of Wales, Trinity St David, and I'm also responsible for the Wales Pen Cymru Secretariat. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit in Welsh and in English. Um, Wales Pen Cymru is a bilingual organisation, though of course our members also speak uh, languages other than Welsh and English. So with Lloyd Pen Cymru, an all in Dwyvilin Deg Petwar, or Dan Arweiniad Sally Baker, a man hyfryd gweld Sally yma heddiw. Wales Pen Cymru was established in 2014, so we're much younger than the Scottish Pen. Um, and we were established under the direction, directorship of Sally Baker, who is with us this evening as well. Then he would be put in Guithio and Agosiaun, have Argumined, Turkeg, a ma and Hamri, Argumined, Kurdai, the ma and Hamri, Akmagan and Inever, Oelotai, or the Wigaminet Honor. Here in Wales, we have members uh, who are Turkish, and we also have worked with the Kurdish community. Um, in our brief history um, as, a, as the Penn Centre. And so that today is a very important day for us as well. And we know that Caroline Stockford has, has worked very hard to put the day together. And we're delighted to be able to work with Scottish Penn on this event. Um, during the course of, of uh, this afternoon or the, this evening, three of our members will take part. Uh, Wales Pen Cymru President, Llywydd uh, Pen Cymru, Mena Elvin, Hefyd Luca Pachi, and Hefyd, of course, Caroline Stockford. Uh, we're really pleased that these three members are able to, uh, to play such an important role in this event. Our solidarity as a, as a, as a, a Pen Centre, as a bilingual nation, uh, is today with the writers in prison in Turkey, the Kurdish writers and the Turkish writers. Um, man, Denin Kid Sevish, Belglad, Sidwedi Bruidro, Rossen Hauli, Yethadol, 
hefo yr awduron sydd dan glo heddiw yn hwrci y cwrdiaid a'r Twrciaid. We fought over many decades for linguistic rights here in Wales, for our national language to belong to every person living in Wales, regardless of where they come from, of whether they speak it or not. It is a common heritage for all of us, and it is also part of our future, of all our futures. Felly, mae'n bleser gen i gael deud geiriau byr yma ar Anne Wales Pen Cymru, a dwi'n falch iawn yn bod ni'n gallu cydsefyll heddiw a chwar yn rhan a cydweithio efo Scottish Pen. I'm delighted to be able to say a few words on behalf of Wales Pen Cymru. Do join Wales Pen Cymru if you live in Wales. We would love to have uh, writers, bloggers, journalists, whatever your form of writing, please join us, make your contribution. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be able to share this event with Scottish Pen and to focus on the writers who are in prison, unjustly so. We send our solidarity. Diolch yn fawr iawn. Thank you. Over to you, Jane. Thank you. <laughs> and I have my document back. Um, so thank you so much for that, Ellen, um, and taking over there. Um, I do want to still draw your attention to the empty chair, but can I ask that it's not screen shared, please? Um, I have noticed that it's in a tile, so people can see if they move along um, their faces, you can you can come to the, the empty chair, but um, I didn't expect the, the screen share to take away my document. So the empty chair is so important to any day of the Day of the Imprisoned Writer. And as I said, it's, as I said it's, it really is about that emphasis on absence um, of the writers who cannot be here. And particularly, I think there's something really strong when we've had these face-to-face -face meetings and there's been a, um, an adult empty chair in the room. There is that real sense of um, their absence bringing um, that absence bringing their presence into the room. And so we wanted it, um, even though it's it's a tile um, on your screen, we wanted that um, here today. Um, I think today we, we also remember um, writers who have, who have died in prison. The journalist and human rights activist, Azam John Askarov, he died in, uh, he's a, a Ubek journalist and human rights activist who died in a Kyrgyzstan prison in September of this year. And um, a Scottish pen, we continue to campaign um, on behalf of Daphne Caruana and Galicia, who was murdered um, in Malta on October the 16th, three years ago. We also learned to treasure good news. And um, shortly after an interview with Scottish Pen and Louise Welsh as part of Glasgow's Creative Conversations, Beruz Bichani escaped um, prison in Papua New Guinea. He has now had his visa extended in New Zealand. In February this year, Pen members held their breath as Turkish writer Asli Erdogan was expected to receive a nine year sentence, prison sentence. However, the charges were dropped and she remains um, safe in Germany um, at the moment. So we live in a time where erosion and direct breach of human rights is commonplace, where the integrity and commitment of state parties and government fail to uphold human rights and at times actively harm citizens for simply expressing themselves. The American writer Rebecca Solnit states that being unable to tell your story is a living death and sometimes it's a literal one. She speaks of silence as intimidation and repression and that words bring us together and we'll, we'll experience that today, both from the writers who are in prison um, and from hearing messages that they have sent directly to us for, for this day. Um, she quotes Ursula Le Guin saying, silence is what allows people to suffer without recourse, what allows hypocrisies and lies to grow and flourish, crimes to go unpunished. If our voices are essential aspects of our humanity, to be rendered voiceless is to be dehumanized or excluded from our very own humanity. I will return a bit later to see how we can use our words and voice to demand justice for the four writers 
today. So what I'd really like to do now is to move on to um, the readings from different um, the, the different imprisoned writers. I just wanted to check that Louise was actually here. I hadn't seen her. Lisa, could you let me know if Louise is here? Hi, Jane. So I, I don't see her name listed, but I've just sent her an email with the link just in case. There's a chance she might be here, but her name just isn't obvious. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep trying to get in touch. But I don't believe she's up right away. No, she? no, she's not up first. So I just wanted to, to, to double check that. Sure. Um, that's lovely. Thank you. Okay, so the first writer um, we'll hear from and about is Ilhan Sami Chumak. Um, we have um, Mena Elvin. Um, she will read a poem she wrote to Ilhan herself. She will read a few lines of Rowan in Welsh and then the rest in English. This will be followed by Ilan's response to the poem translated and read in English by Caroline Stockford of Wales Pen Cymru. Epic Ausel will update on Ilhan Chumak's case um, for, for 10 minutes. And after that, we'll actually have a recording of Scottish Pen member James Robertson's um, translation of Ilhan's poem in Scots. So can I pass over to you, Mena? Thank you. <clears throat> Naswatha, good evening. It's good to be here. And I'm going to be reading one of three poems I've written to Ilan. And it's the poem I'm going to read is about the Rowan tree. Um, in Wales, we and in Welsh, we have an old poetic device, which is uh, Llatai, which is uh, sending a message to another poet, uh, be it uh, the wind or be it a seagull. In my case, I wanted to send him a leaf from the rowan tree. And the rowan tree in Welsh is Criavolen. If you break that down, it means a cry from behind a veil. So I'll read part in Welsh, an extract, and then I'll read it in its entirety in English. Criavolen. Piscallon. Mi anfon nhw'n lata i ti yn dy gaeth ywed. Ni chaniateir allwedd, nid oes modd rhoi awyr fy ngwlad i ti. Na chostrel o law sy'n gwneud ein gwlad mor nodedig. Na mi anfon nhw'n ddatad ddeilen, criadolen, un hardd yw dal am hir yn dy ddwylo. If I could, I'd send you a lata i ti o sel. A key is too obvious, and the air won't be held. I could send a jar of Welsh rain, fabled and holy as home. No, I'll send a leaf, Rowan, the wanderer's tree, to hold with both hands a synthesis of veins. Criavolen, criav olen. Trail the veil tears of a poem with limbs. Gaze from her bows at a sky clarified and wander free in the secret gifts of Awen, in the secret gifts of the Mills. Thank you very much for reading your beautiful poem to Ilhan. And we know from Ipo Kozal, who's been taking the poems to and from the, uh, the prison, that Ilhan's very moved and, in, in, and really enjoying writing with um, with poets around the world. So I'll now, my name's Caroline Stockford from Wales Pen Cymru, and I'll now read Ilhan's response to that poem by Mena. The poem is called, What Will Remain? One day I'll die, of course. What will remain? The chatai you thought to send me and the beauty of human kindness will remain. The stain of my tears falling drop by drop to mix with Wales's famous rain. As I read your poem, they will remain. 
the leaf you took from the rowan tree and sent to me, that I held with eyes and hands, placed over my heart and swayed back and forth. Light glinted upon time. A butterfly, a tiny impish butterfly alighted to drink water from the hoof print of a mountain goat. The moon came out and I remembered doves. And I remembered the fresh scent rising from bread. I held my true love so very tightly after years and years of separation. That's how I read the secret of life's glorious onrush. Read it in the leaf that you sent me. One day I'll die, of course. What will remain? The leaf of the rowan you sent me. My loved ones who weep at my passing. And this poem for you will remain. And I'll now just read a very short bio, uh, the details of Ilhan Sami Chomak. We wanted to read the work before we uh, told you about the person and what has happened to them. And then I'll hand over to Ilhan, uh, beg your pardon, to Ipek Ozal. Ilhan Sami Chomak was a 22 year old geography student when he was arrested in Istanbul in 1994. Uh, he was tor tortured for 19 days and he finally signed a false confession to say that he'd lit forest fires near Istanbul in the name of the outlawed Kurdistan Workers Party, the PKK. He was sentenced to death for the alleged crime of separatism by a military court and was acquitted of the forest fire charges. His sentence was commuted to life in prison, which in Turkey is 36 years. Um, in 2006, the European Court ruled that Ilhan's case should be retried. However, Istanbul's fourth high criminal court found Tromak guilty again and issued another life sentence. This was upheld by the Supreme Court on April the 4th, 2018. Ilhan serving 30 years, I think six years for, uh, can be taken off for good behavior. Uh, it leaves him with three and a half years left to serve on this horrendously long sentence. Penn Norway are running a campaign for Ilhan's release and you can read his poems and more about his case on the website ilhantromak.com. I'll put it in the chat and it's, um, I, I won't spell it out, I'll put it in the chat for you. Mena Elvin, um, myself, and a number of European and American poets are writing poems for and with Ilhan. And now um, we'll hear an update uh, from his close friend, Ipek Ozal, who is a law lecturer in Istanbul, and she's Ilhan's official Mackenzie friend, which means she's his official visitor and can visit him on a weekly basis. So Ipek, thank you very much for joining us. And can you please tell us how, how is Ilhan? Thank, thank you for everybody uh, trying to raise Ilhan's voice and thank you for being here. Good evening. Um, I saw Ilhan uh, last Wednesday. Uh, actually, uh, the pandemic hit the prisons very badly because we don't have any open visitation since March. And for a long time, the visitations were banned. Only for the last two and a half months, we can see each other every when first it was once a month, now it is twice a month. So it's boring because Ilhan is staying alone in his cell. And uh, because of the pandemic, not only the visitation, but also other things, going to the library or some social contacts, sports hours, everything is banned. Everything is banned. They cannot go to the doctor. They cannot uh, go out a little bit in the big garden or the prison. Everything is banned. So it is boring, boring, boring. But uh, I always say Ilhan is a miracle. He really is a miracle. First of all, I forgot to say, and he always knows when I will be talking about him. He makes sure the time uh, that I tell him the time. And he says that I will be concentrating and I will be listening also to you. Now when I close my eyes, I can see him, his face, uh, concentrating and listening. I want to tell it because he says after he leaves the prison when he's free, he will be watching all the videos, which has been done for him for the last 27 years. Unfortunately, we don't have any video access at the prison. So he has never seen any video about him. He hasn't watched a documentary about him, which, is, which was made about him. He never saw me talking about him. So say, say, he said, yes, I will be watching them when I leave the prison. So I must 
tell that he's here at the moment. I forgot to tell him the beginning and he sent us so loud to you also. Uh, he's yes, he's bored, bored, bored. But at the same time, he's working, working very strongly, very hardly, concentrating on the poems. He's very happy as whenever a new poem arrives, he always asks me, no news yet, no poems yet, anything coming. Uh, sometimes you, Caroline, thank you. And she always prioritized it as a work and she always sends it to me immediately when she gets the things. But it takes time for the prison to deliver them to Ilhan. But still, she, when, when I receive something, I read him uh, over the phone because we have 10 minutes uh, conversation every week. And she, he calls once his family, one his brother in Germany, and once a month to me. Uh, so he always knows the, what everybody writes. So this makes his day. And also one more thing happened last week. Um, one of the care, I want to share it with you. One of the guards uh, opened that. They have a um, small garden uh, by their cell. And one of the guards opened the door of the garden one hour before the usual time, which is about seven. 10 or 15 past seven. Actually, they opened it at 8.30, so nearly one and a half hours before they opened the uh, small garden. And he immediately jumped into the garden and he looked in the sky and he said that I saw the sun rising after 27 years. Because when they opened the um, door at 8.30, the sun is already rising, rising, so he doesn't see it. But this time, it was the sun was just coming. And he said, do you know what? I saw the sun, I saw the sun. So he was uh, very much happy. He was carrying it uh, inside him, even when we talked uh, with him. Uh, and apart from that, um, his autobiography uh, with iletişim uh, yayınları will be published in March. Uh, he, he finished it off, you know, he wrote everything. I typed it for him and we sent it to the publishing house. Before, he was a kind of in depression because he remembered the bad days, you know, writing it. And also, I must confess that I pushed him a little bit harder because the publisher said that this is very real. This is becoming very real. And I asked him, Ihan, can you write more about these days before you were arrested? What happened? This happened. And actually, it was hard because I forgot that I knew all because I always carried inside me. I forgot that writing about torture and being alone, and also remembering his brother who passed away years ago when he was in prison, writing about him, but again being alone, having nobody to share after his heart, her heart. And he said that he was having nightmares, nightmares. Um, uh, but yes, the sun is rising. So uh, again, he put his mood back and um, He's waiting for the book coming. He's waiting for the poems coming. Uh, and he's concentrating and uh, working. And he said, lots so hello, lots so love to you all. And he said, he said, he said, do you make sure that you tell my thanks to everybody as well? Yes, I say thank you on behalf of him as well. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Epic. Um, Lisa, can we have James's poem to follow now? Lovely, thank you. Hi, Lisa, are you there? Lovely, thank you. Lisa, I don't know if you know, there's no sound. Sorry about that, I'll, I'll try again. To don't worry. Everyone. Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay. This is a translation of Ilhan's poem, Things That Are Not Here, um, from Turkish into English, and then from, this is the Scots version. This should be it now, sorry about that. I just need to, to share the computer sound. Here we go. There's nae bairns climbing o'er the wa' to plunk the school. 
be a good really human bond to mark a friendship just a few words. There's no stains here, that's chalky stains. No floors to hoard the dew, no rivers scaling off the map. No waff of fresh fake sesame breed to draw a throng of folk. No women, douce, kind-hearted, raw. No canny streak it on the grass, Max sheer the skies I biden. There is no connel, nor a lamp for by. Nay darkness, no. Darkness, there is no name. Nay turnings on the season's tides, nay eclipses of the moon, nay yird, nay plants, plain set and bonny, nay loof of cart, nay bringe a horse, drook it with sweat, nay curtain for the wintry flower, nay grapes in mocky clusters. Life, send it. Fe the sun, there is no earth or earthen here, but a way out, aye, there's aye a way out. Thanks. Thanks all. Now I I think we're moving, we're meant to move on to um, to Louise Welsh and Amit Alton. Now, I think there's a problem with Louise. So what I thought, we do have Amit's um, work and biography, but I thought perhaps if we could just give a few minutes to see what's happened to Louise, because she was at the practice yesterday, so she she's um, she's aware of this. And I wondered if we moved on to Nedim Turfent, if that was okay with Luca Pachi and um, Barush Altentash, if that's okay with you. That, uh, yes, that's completely okay with me. Um, I'm just also my. My internet connection doesn't seem to be very stable, so I'm going to keep it short. Can can everybody hear me now? Okay, good. And then I'm, I'm uh, because Zoom told me it's unstable, and I'm um, I think it's very stressful <laughs> because of this. So, um, well, thank you for having me here. My name is Barish, and I'm a journalist based in Istanbul, and I'm also the co-director of the Media and Law Studies Association, and uh, uh, which has been uh, legally representing Nedim since uh, the January of 2018. And that was uh, shortly after his conviction already in a, you know, a, by a, a Turkish court. And I also, uh, uh, I'm not boasting, but take pride a little bit as the, his first translator, because I was the, uh, I, uh, he sent a poem to me from prison and I translated it. And since then, and, um, all pen centers have been very supportive and uh, owing to also Caroline Stockford, so a big thank uh, thank you to her here as well. <laughs> and um, and um, Nedim is also very grateful, and he has been following this. And uh, actually, he shared a message with with you all uh, for today's event, which I'll come back to um, later. So I just want to uh, talk a little bit about you know um, Nedim's case, uh, because for those of you who don't who might not know him, and and I've talked with our lawyers to you know find out if there are any update updates in a situation. So just uh, I'm going to keep it short, but again, I said uh, for those of uh, you who don't know him, there might be people um, who are maybe not familiar with him. He uh, Nidim uh, is used to be a journalist for the the Kurdish uh, Diha News Agency, which was shut down in uh, after Turkey's coup attempt in 2016. So. Um, um, you know, earlier it was stated that yes, uh, the Kurdish journalists are affected worse than uh, freedom of expression uh, violations, uh, worse than anybody uh, else in Turkey in, in, in terms of freedom of expression violations. And this is very true. Currently, there are about 86 uh, journalists in prison. And I would say about 60% are uh, uh, either working for the Kurdish media or um, or they're Kurdish or, you know, they have reported on the Kurdish issue. So Nedim is one of those journalists. and. Uh, and uh, today he's been uh, in prison for, I, I use like a date calculator for this, for uh, 1,648 days. So that's four years, six months, and three days. And um, 
So what? Uh, so in, Tur in Turkey in 2015 and 2016 started uh, very large scale operations in our Kurdish cities, um, and uh, um, where which allegedly also led to a lot of uh, civilian deaths. And uh, uh, as part of those operations in April, uh, there was a detention of 40 Kurdish civilians in, in Hakkari in a, um, in a district called Yuksekova. And uh, Nedim uh, got hold of a footage of this, uh, uh, of this detention process. And it's, it's, on, it's online, you can still find it. And I don't know if uh, it has any um, subtitles, but it's very hard to watch. So these people are um, local you know, um, workers and store owners. And uh, they were basically handcuffed uh, by you know, these uh, special forces officers. Um, you know, um, uh, they were pushed on the ground and then you know, the, uh, handcuffed from behind. The, so the entire terrorist treatment, which is like, there's nothing like this in, in procedurally, right, on paper. And, and this uh, footage also shows a, a police officer shouting horribly racist uh, remarks. So um, things like, you will see the power of the Turk, what has the state done to you? So basically uh, 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 just yelling at these people, horrible remarks for just being Kurdish because these were civilians and that this wasn't part of those you know, um, operations against the, these, um, and it wasn't even an, um, a conflict thing. It, they were just uh, detained. And, uh, and actually at the time, the prime minister who, was, uh, who has since parted ways a long time ago, and he's you know, uh, starting his own political thing now, actually started an investigation into these people. So Nedim basically published this video uh, for the Dihan News Agency. And um, this was, I think, April, uh, maybe March, maybe April, 2016. And shortly after he started receiving threats from the, um, open threats from the police and, and a lot of death threats online from anonymous or bot accounts. And they were very scary. I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna go into detail. And, uh, also, um, shortly after this, I think it was a, 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 in mid-May, on the 12th of May, 2016, he was detained. And uh, the next day, he was actually arrested formally by a court uh, on charges of membership of, in a terrorist organization. So, uh, but we didn't see the indictment for a long time. Um, so they waited for 13 months, more than a year, uh, for, uh, to prepare the uh, indictment. So the indictment came out later in the summer of 2017. And so this was a very interesting indictment because the only evidence against uh, 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 Nedim were, were statements of 20 people. And uh, I just wanna, this is very interesting. Who said uh, Nedim is a member of uh, the PKK in Turkey, basically. And also, um, so there were seven hearings back to back, uh, which is also very um, fast for the local, uh, for the Turkish judici judiciary normally. But uh, after the coup, the coup had happened then, this was a bit normal because they didn't want people um, you know, taking their uh, arrest situation to the European court. So, but this was in seven or eight hearings uh, back to back. So the indictment came out in June and Nedim was convicted in December. Um, all of, in every hearing, all of these people uh, basically withdrew their statements. And, um, and there was a lot of media attention, uh, local media attention in this case because uh, everybody, you know, who, uh, each witness he who took uh, his or state uh, his or her statement back uh, was provi providing very deep, uh, you know, graphic details of torture, literally in the courtroom. You no, know, I don't know this guy at all. I've never seen him in my life. I did say so because they were extracting my teeth, or literally, or you know, or they were banging my head against a wall. And so there were uh, um, these are all in the court statements. So all of the um, the witnesses, about one. Uh, withdrew their statements saying it was extracted under torture and, and giving, you know, providing very uh, uh, vivid detail, unfortunately, of this in the courtroom. But regardless, Nedim was given, uh, and really this is the only evidence is, you know, these people saying that he, they know him and then uh, extracting all their statements. And, uh, but he was given uh, eight years and nine months in prison uh, in December uh, 2017. So um, also, um, you know, on, um, Nedim never uh, was never in the courtroom for any of these uh, hearings, which we think is a, is a right violation. He always uh, connected through um, this uh, video link we call Segbis in Turkey. And, um, 
Also, there were um, you know some defense statements he made in Kurdish. They, the trend, the level of translation was problematic. There were a lot of, you know, other than the torture <laughs> claims, there were many other uh, procedural problems with all of these hearings. But he was, uh, um, you know, given the sentence nevertheless, and uh, and unfortunately, two years later, last year in May, the uh, Court of Cassation upheld the sentence, and our lawyers have taken his case. Uh, to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which uh, I, I can't remember the uh, time of the application. I wrote it down, but I'm not now not seeing it on my notes. Uh, but it's still pending there. We haven't heard from the court negatively or um, positively. So basically, the updates, the legal update is that there's not much of an update and he's been um, in prison now for about four and a half years. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so basically, this is his legal situation. He was just a uh, reporting on a on what we you know uh, for our right to information and this was a very important story and i think uh i don't know if anything really came out of that investigation for the police officers but the fact that there was an investigation into you know their handling of these detentions is something in turkey so this this uh, is very good actually for local journalism i uh, maybe you know in other countries where democracy is better this might not be appreciated but it's very important that you know this was an issue and then a legal, some sort of an investigation was launched into this. So it is, it's a very important video, uh, you know, albeit being horrible in, in terms of, um, if you can find it online. But, um, so this was another, you know, show trial and, um, and as was said earlier, many of our journalists are accused of um, um, you know, terror related crimes with no evidence of, you know, actual terrorist or uh, violent activity. But during this time, uh, Nedim has been uh, writing a lot he wrote for the Tots newspaper. He was also, you know, producing this poetry. Now, um, one of his books is coming out in Switzerland uh, in a few months in German. And we've uh, uh, published one on PDF. We took it off. Now we're going to have a, a, um, a, another one come out in Turkish uh, um, in, in a month or, or um, two. He's been very, uh, um, very hardworking. He's been learning German, other languages, and you know, um, corresponding with a lot of pen members, and he's very grateful for that. And uh, and he's in one prison, which can be very. Um, so the um, prisons differ in Turkey according to the management as well. We see a lot of arbitrary decisions, right? So uh, one thing we get a lot is that uh, can Nedim take letters in uh, English, or um, I think it was Pen Norway, or or maybe I am not sure. He had a. Uh, subscription for the Guardian, and then after a while, they said uh, we're not going to let this in because it's in English. So uh, the answer is both yes and no because it completely depends on the uh, prison administration's mood at a certain time. And these um, prison um, um, the, these uh, administrators change. So when a new person comes in, they might say, "Oh, you know, they're not uh, we're not letting in English uh, letters," or or they sometimes charge a huge amount of money to translate this. So I suggest basically writing him still and, and you know, give it a shot. <laughs> so he might get it or he might not. But uh, as I stated earlier, um, so Sunday mornings are um, his phone days. And um, so, uh, so uh, I have a fresh message from him uh, that he gave me particularly for this meeting this Sunday. And this was uh, basically I recorded it on, on the phone. So it wasn't a written message. So it was a no, I'm just saying that it, he didn't write this, but he actually spoke this. So I uh, took the liberty of translating this into English for you. So I want to share that uh, with you all um, as my, um, you know, to end, to end my uh, speech. Thank you. Uh, so these are Nedim's words. I would like to uh, thank Scottish Pen and, and uh, Wales Pen Kimro for the panel they're holding on this day. Such support is extremely meaningful and valuable for freedom of expression. In Turkey and in one prison where I'm also being held, a large number of writers and journalists remain behind bars. The weight of authoritarianism is increasing everywhere. And this brings about an increase in pressure, particularly on literature and the free word. Despite all of this, many writers, poets, and journalists are resisting, continue, continuing to rely on their writing and, and drawing strength from this. There are countless others all around the world who support uh, freedom of the freedom of the word and of literature, fighting through campaigns against attempts to rein in the freedom of the word. It is owing to this fact, the largeness of this group, we still find the courage and possibility to say out our own words. For this, we're very happy, and we gain an immense sense of power from this. 
together, all of us standing by side by side, we will continue to fight for freedom of speech and freedom of literature. Thank you so much, um, Barush, and thank you so much for ending ending with his um, words as well. It's it's always incredible to hear directly from um, the writer who's in prison. So um, send our heartfelt thanks to Nedim for 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 the the message. And um, can I pass over to Luca Pachi to? Um, read Nedim's poem and um, just a little bit of his, his biography to, to finish the session off. Hello. Um, uh, Hi, Luca. Um, I'm Luca from Pencumbri and um, I feel very honoured um, to take part in this. Um, I will be reading Nedim's poem which I think is um, beautiful. If you think that he's a journalist and he fights for truth every single moment of his life. Let my heart give life. Your heart has become the earth. Let it give Elysir into the veins, bring fertility to the soil from the springs behind the mountain calf. Let the benevolence of the crops be the silver key to life. Let your heart soothe the farmer, the peasant, the day laborer, the distressed. Let it massage the broken wings of birds with ointments let it grant refuge to the ants working collectively in solidarity. Let heart filled with generosity, giving butterflies an extra day of life. Let it be a lifeline like the womb. Let your heart be crystal clear, as clear as water. Let it give life to the lifeless. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely beautifully, beautifully read. Um, and again, wonderful to, to hear Nedim's um, words too. Um, we now move on to Amit Alton. Um, and um, unfortunately, um, I don't know what's happened with, with Louise. Um, we, well, sh we wish her well. She's um, a Scottish Pen member and has attended many events for Scottish Pen. And um, she read Amit Alton's um, work at the Scottish Parliament in Day of the Imprisoned Writer in 2018 with the presence of our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. So I wish her well and I hope everything is, is okay with, with her. Um, uh, fortunately, we have uh, Dave Manderson here, um, who is the chair of the Writers for Peace um, committee and he has um, volunteered um, to, to read from um, Amit Alton's work. The, the piece is a standalone piece, um, although it's now included in his recent um, book, From Prison, I Will Never See the World Again. It's translated by Yasmin Chongar and published by um, Granta. So I'll hand over to Dave and following Dave's um, reading and biography, Gurkhan Austuran will um, give us an update on Ahmet's case. So over to you, Dave, if, if that's okay. Hi, thank you, uh, Jane. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Here we go. The Writer's Paradox by Ahmet Altan. A moving, a moving object is neither where it is nor where it is not, concludes Zeno in his famous paradox. Ever since my youth, I have believed this paradox better suited to literature, or indeed to writers, 
and to physics. I write these words from a prison cell. Add the sentence, I write these words from a prison cell to any narrative and you will add tension and vitality. A frightening voice that reaches out from a dark and mysterious world. The brave stance of the plucky underdog and an ill-concealed call for mercy. It is a dangerous sentence that can be used to exploit people's feelings and writers do not always refrain from using such sentences in a manner that serves their interests when the possibility of touching a person's feelings is at stake. Even understanding that this is their intention may be enough for the reader to feel compassion towards the writer of that sentence. Wait, before you start playing the drums of mercy for me, listen to what I tell you. Yes, I am being held in a high security prison in the middle of a wilderness. Yes, I am in a cell where the door is opened and closed with the rattle and clatter of iron. Yes, they give me my meals through a hatch in the middle of the door. Yes, even the top of the small stone paved courtyard where I pace up and down is covered with a steel cage. Yes, I am not allowed to see anyone other than my lawyers and my children. Yes, I am forbidden from sending even a two letter line to my loved ones. Yes, whenever I have to go to the hospital, they pull handcuffs out of a cluster of ironwork and put them on my wrists. Yes, each time they take me out of my cell, orders such as raise your arms, take off your shoes, slap me in the face. All of this is true, but it is not the whole truth. On summer mornings, when the first rays of sun come through the naked bar windows and pierce my pillow like shining spears, I hear the playful songs of the birds of passage that have nested under the courtyard eaves and the strange crackles that the prisoners pacing the other courtyards make as they crush empty water bottles under their feet. I wake up with the feeling that I still re reside in that pavilion with a garden where I spent my childhood or, for whatever reason, and I don't really know the reason for this, at one of those hotels in the cheery French street films, French streets of the film Douche. When I wake up with the autumn rain hitting the window bars, bearing the fury of the northern winds, I start the day on the, the shores of the Danube River in a hotel with burning torches in the front, which are lit every night. When I wake up with the whisper of the snow piling up inside the window bars in winter, I start the day in that, da in that, I start the day in that Dakar with a front window where Dr. Zhivago took refuge. Until now, I have never woken up in prison, not once. They may have the power to imprison me, but no one has the power to keep me in prison. I am a writer. I am neither where I am nor where I am not. Wherever you lock me up, I will travel the world with the wings of my endless mind. Besides, I have friends all around the world who help me travel, most of whom I have never met. Each eye that reads what I have written, each voice that repeats my name, holds my hand like a little cloud and flies me over the lowlands, the springs, the forests, the seas, the towns and the streets. They host me quietly in their houses, in their halls, in their rooms. I travel the whole world in a prison cell. As you may well guess, I possess a godly arrogance, one that is not often acknowledged, but is, that is unique to writers and has been handed down from one generation to another for thousands of years. I possess a confidence that grows like a pearl within the hard shells of literature. I possess an immunity. I am protected by the steel armour of books. I am writing this in a prison cell, but I am not in prison. I am a writer. I am neither where I am nor where I am not. You can imprison me, but you cannot keep me here because like all writers, I have magic. I can pass through walls with ease. Thank you. So just to, uh, thanks very much, just to read uh, Ahmet's biography. Uh, Ahmet Altan is an acclaimed Turkish novelist, essayist and journalist. In a career spanning 30 years, he has written 10 novels, which have been translated into many languages and reached bestseller lists around the world. He is serving a 10 and a half year prison sentence on trumped up charges of knowingly and willingly assisting a terrorist organization. That's a quote. First arrested in September 2016, 
Ahmet Altan spent over three years in pre-trial detention in what amounts to judicial harassment. Sensen, sentenced on 4th of November 2019, following proceedings marred by violations of his right to a fair trial, he was released pending appeal, only to be sent back to jail eight days later. He is currently being held in Salivri prison outside Istanbul. A date for his appeal hearing has yet to be set. Penn International believes that Ahmet Altan is being imprisoned solely for the peaceful exercise of his right to freedom of expression and calls for his immediate and unconditional release. Altan's most recent book is based on his prison experiences. I Will Never See the World Again is translated into English by Yasmin Congar and published by Granta. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, Dave. That was a wonderful reading. Um, can I pass over to Gurkan for an update on Amit's situation for 10 minutes? Gurkan, are you there? I will try to keep it brief, uh, minding the time. Thank so uh, I'm Gurkan Özturan uh, from Dokuzayit News in Turkey. I'm a writer journalist uh, for more than 14 years now. And uh, over the many years, I have been part of uh, multiple pen events, and I'm so glad to be here tonight. I wish it was for a better purpose, better reason than to observe the day of the imprisoned writer. But nonetheless, uh, it is uh, the day of the imprisoned writer, and all around the world, there are uh, hundreds of writers that are behind bars. And today, I'm going to be talking about Ahmed Altan, a 70-year-old writer, novelist, and journalist. I want to start off with a confession. I'm not a, a wonderful Ahmed Altan reader, in fact. But apart from my affinity uh, or with interest in his literature, it just tears my heart that a writer is in prison for towing the line of the government. Obviously, no journalist or writer should have to sit behind bars for bringing up the troubles of our times, especially not the gadflies who make people see the darkness they are spreading. Author of 14 books and uh, countless articles, Ahmed Altan is not a stranger with court cases or trials. His father also, in fact, holds a record in Turkey for the number of cases he stood in trial. He himself has been making appearances in courts uh, since 1995. So uh, as previously mentioned, Ahmed Altan wrote uh, his memoirs in prison, I Will Never See the World Again, and published in 2018. And after publishing this, a year later, he saw the world again uh, for a brief moment, but I will come back to that. So today marks the 1,506 days that Ahmed has been in prison. Even if he is released today, even if there is a miracle happening in the next few hours and a judge orders his release from prison, it will be 1,506 days too late. And last year he had said, they may have the power to imprison me, but no one has the power to keep me in prison. So he is free in his mind. He is free in his writing. The pen he holds is giving his, uh, the freedom. His father, Chetin Altan, at the age of 88, uh, back in 2009, had received Culture and Arts Grand Award from the hands of uh, AKP chair and prime minister of the time and today's president, Erdogan. Back then, when receiving the award, he said, I'm surprised because we are used to being handcuffed, not handed over awards. And Erdogan back then had said during the award ceremony that Turkey is no longer the Turkey that calls up Chetan Altan to the courts 300 times, nor the Lux Nazım Hikmet in prison cells for 12 years. Yet again, Chetan Altan's son, Ahmet Altan, only eight years later, uh, only seven years later in 2016, was accused of involvement in a failed coup attempt. He is accused of terrorism charges, and uh, he was charged with an attempt to overthrow the government in Turkey. There was also an additional accusation to him, which was publishing subliminal messages through his journalism and promoting a coup attempt. This latest charge later, later on disappeared from the indictments uh, and no longer is cited. But uh, this is, of course, coming from a government that previously claimed that uh, there are a large number of opposition politicians using telekinesis to overthrow the government, which shows basically that uh, the government is looking for a traitor or an enemy under every stone. 
But returning to Altan's case, he was originally detained, later released, only a week later to be arrested again, and then uh, until last year kept in prison, last year released and then arrested again, and is still sitting in prison. So Istanbul 22nd, uh, 26th have a penal court sentenced Altan to life in prison on February 16, 2018. Yet it was returned from the appeals court and on November 4, 2019, Ahmet Altan was sentenced again, this time to 10 years and six months in prison. And considering the time he had already spent in prison, ruled for the, for, uh, the judge ruled for his release alongside uh, Nazla Ilijak, another journalist who was in prison, who was also, re uh, who was also released, but uh, was also convicted uh, and received eight years and nine months uh, in prison. With this sentencing, the court also, also ordered Ahmed Altan's release pending the outcome of the appeal. Altan was released from prison that night and in the expectations of seeing gratitude for the authorities that let him walk out of prison but he was not grateful. Why should he be? He was unjustly imprisoned, met many others in prison who have lost their voices and their silent echoes calling for justice were being unheard. Ahmed Altan became the voice of those voiceless upon his release. And he penned an article, the paper flute. Only eight days after his, his release from prison, Ahmed Altan was arrested again. This time on uh, November 12th, 2019, almost uh, exactly a year ago, after the prosecutor uh, opposed his release order uh, following the verdict, Ahmed Altan was arrested again. And Altan's case has been pending for a year before the court, uh, court of Cassation for a review of his last conviction. His application to the European Court of Human Rights also made four years ago is yet to be considered. Due to these double arrests uh, happening quite often in Turkey these days, I actually lost my faith even in the release orders. Previously, I used to say, I will not believe in rumors of release from prison until I see the person in Istanbul or Ankara or wherever they may uh, be going after their release. There often emerges these uh, rumors regarding the release of uh, a certain person, a politician, a political prisoner, or a writer or a journalist. But just when the release order comes, either before walking out of the prison or right after walking out of the prison, the person gets uh, arrested again. So now I have started saying, we will have to wait for a month and see the person walk around the streets for about a month before we can consider them released from prison. And even then, how much of a release is it? I'm not certain anymore. The accusations to journalists in, in this trial have been vague and obscure, and many people, including Ahmed Altan, have, uh, have been turned into a chip in the hands of a regime that is bargaining people's lives for treats from other countries. Currently, he is still serving his time, 10 years and uh, six months, uh, his prison sentence is there for aiding and abetting the uh, terrorist organization without being a member of the terrorist organization. Altan sits in prison, but last year he had said uh, regarding the conviction, uh, the final trial. He said, writers who through pen and paper craft, uh, can craft men, climates, laws, wars, always look like mythical gods to me. Having now heard what you're going to do, I feel as if gods from across the globe are gathering here. So uh, this in fact concludes what I'm going to talk about uh, Ahmed Altan. And I would like to give a, a shout out, a reminder for everyone, please join the pen campaign, write a letter, send cards to Ahmed Altan. And for those of you who might be interested, I will be sharing the link to his article, The Paper Flute, published on The Guardian last year, right, uh, right in between his uh, brief moment of freedom in between two imprisonments. That's wonderful, Gurkhan. And, and we will, um, at the end of the session, be having the addresses of the, uh, you know, writers, including um, Amit Alton, for, to encourage people to um, write to the writers, as well as um, we'll be discussing two letters that we've drawn up to um, police pressure on government and Turkish embassies to, um, really, Sam at Alton. So thanks for for that reminder. Um, 
for now. Um, and we'll hear more from you later if we have um, time for a plenary, but thank you so much for that. And thank you, Dave, for the, the, the reading. Um, we now um, finally move in terms of the writer to, to writers to um, Osman Kavala. Um, Lisa Clark is now going to read a letter sent to us by Osman Kavala and translated literally within the last few days by Caroline Stockford. Um, and yes, Lisa will also read some of, um, will read Osman Kavala's biography. Caroline Stockford will then give a, a brief update on Osman Kavala's case, including his new indictment and Penn Norrie's work on the Turkey indictment project. Um, so if I could hand over to you first, Lisa, to um, read Osman's letter to us. Thanks, Jane. Um, so um, my name is Lisa Clark and I'm the project manager at Scottish Pen. And as Jane's already said, this is a message from Osman Kavala to mark the day of the imprisoned writer. I am not a writer, but I have carried out a variety of projects with writers and publishers. One of the most exciting of these for me and one which comes to mind very often these days is a project we carried out in the early 2000s called Rising Over Prison Walls. In this particular project, we ran a series of writing and art workshops in prisons, where we also showed films and held seminars. As part of this project, in conjunction with Penn International's Writers in Prison Committee and the publishing houses Metis and Kanat, we published the short stories and poems of many prisoners who had not formally thought of themselves or been thought of as writers. Writing, of course, is an activity that frees a person and to publish writing is a vehicle for sharing life with other people. Both of these are hugely important for those who are in prison. Literature, as well as enhancing and developing our thinking, allows others to enter other people's worlds and in turn, literature increases our feelings of empathy. We need this capacity for empathy in order to internalize legal norms. A lack of the capacity for empathy can be seen in the actions of those members of the judiciary who deprive innocent people of their liberty, despite the fact that they themselves are very well versed indeed in legal protocols. We can say the same thing for a wider section of people who remain silent in the face of injustices and who tell themselves that such injustices are normal. Of course, it would not be very realistic of us to put all our faith in literature and hope that it would be able to iron out the problems in the legal system. That is the job of political actors. However, in order for us to live together in a civilized manner as individuals who listen to one another, understand one another and who react in unison against injustice, we need to protect and develop our capacity for empathy. In this new world of ours, with its own reality of internet-based information that muddies our relationships, in which artificial intelligence and the manipulation of algorithms come further into the foreground, I believe we need writers and literature more than ever. I do not see the writers in prison campaigns of the Penn family in its varied corners of the world as merely a manifestation of empathy and justice, but as an exercise in the education of humankind. I am extremely happy that you are remembering me today, along with my prison neighbour, Ahmet Altan, with Nadim Turfent, and with the poet Ilhan Sami Chomak, who has spent so many long years in prison. I would like to thank Pale <laughs> Wales Pen Cymru and Scottish Pen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for reading that wonderful letter that we got last night from uh, Osman Kavala. So again, I'm Caroline Stockford. I'm a member of Wales Pen Cymru, and I also work as the Turkey advisor for Norwegian Pen. Um, and I, they, they sent me to observe, I mean, I first started with Wales Pen actually observing trials in Turkey of journalists uh, back in about five years ago. And the worst case I saw then was the Jumriyet trial, the big newspaper trial, the first big show trial in the Silivri courtroom. 
And then the second to that has been this terrible Gezi Park trial in which Osman Kavala was, uh, was indicted with a 657 page indictment of nonsense. Um, there were 16 defendants in that case. And when you go to that courtroom, um, it's in Silivery Prison where three of these people are being held. There are 23,000 people in prison, 23 men are locked up in Silivery. There is a school there, there are shops, there is a mosque, there's a whole community there because of all the staff involved and, and the huge amount of, uh, of soldiers and the army that's present. There are young conscripts doing military service. And when you go into the courtroom, uh, the courtroom holds hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, it was built, it was purpose built by Erdogan's regime in order, you know, because they, they must have foreseen the crackdown that they were going to have on their own people and, and, and were looking to bring so many, you know, people into trial at the same time, mass trials. Um, there could, there can be over a hundred defendants seated in that courtroom. It's, it's the size of about nine basketball pitches. There are big screens so that you can follow the proceedings. There's room for 300 members of the public to observe at the back, uh, 200 judges, and there's room for 100 or two of, of, of civil society observers and, and um, uh, journalists. So basically, Osman Kavala, um, the reason there was a trial against Osman Kavala was because they saw the Gezi uprising, which was a, a, a big movement across Turkey. It was a protest about cutting down trees in a park in the middle of Istanbul. Uh, the tents of the, of the student protesters were burned and broken down one night by the police and then the public showed their reaction. It was, an up, it was a spontaneous uprising that spread across Turkey because people were fed up with Erdogan telling them how to live, what to do. He went too far, he was telling women not to laugh in the street and they should have 2.2 children and, and, and so forth. But, but what happened afterwards is that the, that regime has deliberately weaponized the judicial system and they have tried to use, they've tried to go back in time and they're going back on everybody's timelines and social media and they're finding any comment uh, relating perhaps to the incursions into the Southeast in 2015 and, and that is being used as evidence of terrorism and it's sending people to prison. Um, the reason Osman Kavala was in court with the other 15 defendants initially they were architects, lawyers, they were members of civil society who was putting this campaign forward to save the park, um, was because it seems as though Osman Kavala, Ahmet Altan, Deniz Yücel was also uh, political hostages. So I'd just like to say a word about Osman's case, but I would say a quick word about the weaponization of the judicial system. The, the, what Penn also stands for is, is upholding the rule of law because the rule of law, Turkey's constitution, the European convention, they are things that protect freedom of expression. They protect the right to liberty and security, and they are vital for all of us. And I'm afraid to say that Turkey has absolutely flouted both its own constitution and the European convention, to, which actually sub, you know, is um, more important, as it were, it's the last you know, resort uh, in the country. That I'm trying to say that the European convention is, is uh, is what it, it has more power than the actual Turkish constitution. Now, this I, I'm mentioning this because the um, because there's been a development in in, in Osman Kavala's case. So basically, there were there were six open hearings and two closed hearings in the whole trial. Um, I attended all six of the of the hearings in Silivri, and you know we, we were very sure we were there on the 25th of December, for example, in 2019. And on the 10th of December, the European Court had ruled very strongly that Osman Kavala should be released, that his pre-trial detention prior to sentencing was, was not only unjust and illegal, but it was arbitrary and it was politically motivated. We were obviously quite heartened. Everybody thought that Osman Kavala would be released according to the European um, Court's ruling on, on at this hearing at Christmas, and he was not, and those judges also two to one returned a verdict of, he remains in detention and the case continues. The final hearing then took place on the 8th of February and there, was, there were shock acquittals. They suddenly, after this huge show trial with no evidence, there, there, there were, literally was no evidence put forward to link anybody to any of the actions of pl having planned the Gezi Park uh, protests and tried to bring down the government. They were all acquitted and People in the courtroom and outside were jubilant. And 
as Guru Khan said, you know, uh, I didn't celebrate because I would like to, you know, see Osman Kavala in person being released. I wanted to know he was out because of what happened to other to other people. And sadly, yes, that night, Osman, Osman Kavala had been in prison for almost two years then. And that night or over two years, he was taken instead of being taken to they drop the prisoners, the, the defendants off in a car park at the side of the motorway to, because they don't want any protests at the prison. So usually it's a motorside cafe, motorway cafe. Everybody was waiting and poor Osman Kavala was taken instead in the car with the police straight to the police station. And he was given another indictment, no, I beg your pardon, he was, he was charged, uh, arrested and charged with espionage. Um, these were completely bogus charges again and he was taken back to prison and he's still there now um so the indictments i'll very men brief and briefly mention pen uh, norway's indictment project because we are studying those indictments we're studying 12 indictments this year from these nedim turfens indictment for example ahmed Altans, the cases where journalists are um being uh, imprisoned for years with, on, on, with no evidence um, we, we decided to go back and look at the very basis of the cases and we have found so far we've studied nine indictments and not one of them meets Turkish standards so the procedural code rather than the penal code there is the procedural code for the way that the case is prepared and carried out and in law 170 it tells you exactly what should be in an indictment how it should be presented none of them match it all they seem to do, and also maybe to many of the students, the 70,000 students in prison, is to list the history of a terror organization, then have a secret uh, per, uh, policeman or somebody identifying the person as a terrorist, and that's the end of, there's no evidence in these cases. So we, we are also studying his second indictment. So Osman Kavala is still in prison, and his next, his first hearing in this second bogus case is on the 18th of December, now, it, it is quite a, a, a thankless task sometimes working in human rights in Turkey. We, I'm, I'm always so inspired with all, by all my colleagues like Baraj Altantaj and Gurkan because they live in the country and, and the journalists and the editors of newspapers like Ever Ansel are living this and fighting this every day. We are just observers that come in and out of the country and do our best to spread the news. But there is potentially a glimmer of hope now for prisoners like Ahmet Altan and uh, for Osman Kavala because of the win by Joe Biden in the United States. Mm. It seems as though Erdogan may be softening. He gave a message, I think, on the 11th of November to say that uh, people are, are construing it as there is a need for foreign investment in the country and therefore he will soften. And he's trying to, dis he actually said, we will be reforming the rule of law in 2021. And next thing that happened is that the Council of Judges and Prosecutors issued a document yesterday or the day before to say, we would like a list of any judges who have not upheld European court rulings. This is a real turnaround because, and, and actually they said that the judges who don't do what the European court says will not get promoted. And for me, that just shows that there is a reward scheme in place for judges that they are being controlled potentially by people at the top of the chain there. For example, the, the, the lead judge in the Jumuriet case got promoted to the, the, the Supreme Court straight away. So they're now turning around and saying, instead of potentially having these judges under pressure to ignore the European Court rulings, they're now saying, you know, you must not ignore the European Court rulings. So we can only see that, I, I think, as hope that on the 18th of December, potentially Osman Kavala could be released but I you know I would urge everybody to to write to them and also more importantly as Jane will outline in a moment we need to put pressure on the British government and on the Turkish authorities through their official channels through their foreign uh, foreign um, office you know in the in the um, uh, the embassies in whichever country you live in um, they have to be made responsible for this and the, the British, of, uh, above everybody, sadly, has a very close relationship because of Brexit. Theresa May did some deals immediately with Erdogan, which are now being followed through. And the new head of our security in this country, MI6, is the former ambassador to Ankara, uh, to Ankara of the UK. So there are very close links to Turkey now for trade. And um, I really would urge people to, to um, ask, tell our foreign minister that, that 
human rights must uh, trump, <laughs> I hate to use that word, human rights is far, far more important than the money and trade. And, and the lasting damage done by the oppression of 70,000 students and everybody else in prison in Turkey is, 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 is you know, worth far less than a few cheap deal, uh, a few deals for, uh, for a few aircraft as Theresa May did in January 2017. But I think I've said enough there. Forgive me if I went over time. Um, I'll hand back to Jane now so that she can talk about the letters which we have prepared. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, Caroline, and um, thanks for extending it, actually, because your knowledge and your understanding of what's actually happening is, is so insightful and helpful um, to understand what's happening. And um, following Gurkhan's lead, you also gave a really good push for um, signing and um, letters and being part of um, the campaign in relation to um, all four writers. So um, what you'll find is that in the chat room, there should be copies of letters that um, Lisa Clark and Ricky Monaghan Brown, um, the other co-chair of, well, he will be the chair of the Writers at Risk Committee for Scottish Pen, um, penned to, for you. So there'll be copies in the, um, the chat and you can then either you know download um and sign and send off um and or email but the, the the main thing is is to to try and um build some pressure and momentum particularly as caroline said at this time where there's political change or there's supposed to be political change in america as we speak we, we can capitalize on this kind of shifting of, of ground. And um, I think voices can be heard um, in, a, in a more strong way than they might have done if, if the, this change wasn't actually um, happening. I also wanted to say, you know, that, that, that a lot of, a lot of when, when we hear so much about these writers, there's usually two questions that, that, that people ask. Um, and it's usually, what can I do? And will it make any difference? And one of the things in, in preparation for this, for this event, um, I had a look back on some of the, some of the um, words of writers who either are still in prison or, or who have been in prison. Um, for example, um, the Turkish novelist and journalist Asli Erdogan, um, I had the privilege of meeting her at, at Congress in India in 2018. And she spoke um, about how visionary and trans, the, the visionary and transformative powers of literature and um, keeping alive our belief that writing, the, the written word, uh, can be a form of resistance and a form of resurrection. She said, um, and she also sort of expressed her enormous thanks to the literary world, particularly um, Penn, and how that sense of solidarity throughout her ordeal really was um, a saving grace, both, you know, particularly in terms of our, our mental health. Um, she has experienced enormous um, physical problems and um, since prison, um, and she has also spoken about just the, 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 the impact on her physical health, but also the impact on her emotionally and psychologically. So she said that, that this was an incredible sort of sense of support that she got from um, organizations and from members writing to her and from readers and writers, she said, all over the world um, writing to her. Um, I also um, found a message from Nedim Turfent, which um, relates very, very well to what was said earlier. Um, and he'd said, no matter what the price or consequence might be, we will never compromise from the magical creations of writing and the written word. I'd like to repeat once again, my gratitude to pen members who have stood by me on this path. So many writers have said, 
you know, they are not sure what they would have done without this kind of um, both pressure on governments, um, justices, um, embassies, and the kind of solace and support and solidarity from hearing um, from other writers and readers. So the answer to the questions are always, you know, when, when there is hearing these dire situations for people, the answer is yes, there is always something you can do. Um, and the answer from the writers who have been in prison is yes, it really makes a difference. It can make a difference politically and the sort of wider scale, and it can make a politically um, a, a difference personally for those individuals um, still in prison and still facing um, sentences, whether they be indefinite sentences or sentences that are, are really long. Um, and so we have those letters, they're in the, the, the chat room, so you can, you can download them and we really um, respectfully encourage you to use those letters. Um, and also at the end of the session, we're going to have the addresses, as I said to um, Gokan, I think um, we're having the four addresses of the four writers um, on us, on, on a, um, on the screen when we're leaving so that you can note down um, the addresses and um, be able to send them to send word to the writers. And it's, if, you, if you heard, as you heard earlier on, there was this uh, uh, that amazing um, poem, um, Rowan to, to um, Ilhan and that, that incredible response in return. Um, and, Yes, if, if it can be poetry and prose, how lovely, but if it can be a heartfelt letter of support and concern um, alongside pressure onto government agencies, um, then that is wonderful too. Everything, everything, everything helps. So, um, and as Ellen mentioned earlier, um, before, just before we move into a plenary session, I'm not sure how long we, we can have for that. Um, also, I would encourage you to um, become members of um, Pen Wales Cymru or um, Scottish Pen. And in Scottish Pen, uh, you can become a member as a reader um, uh, as well as a writer and um, join together in committees. There's a variety of committees. This is the obviously the, the Writers at Risk, Writers in Prison Committees for Dave's in Prison Writer, but there are a variety of committees um, where you can, you can lend your support and be active in supporting um, writers. So I'm, I need some guidance here in terms of timing. Um, we have still to hear from Alan Reich's poem, who um, has, has written uh, a, an interpretation of one of Ilhan's poems, and we still have um, a, a, a bit of a plenary session to go. So can I have some guidance about what, what kind of timing we can do, because we're already over time when I promised in the beginning we would not do that. Um, we have done. So Caroline and Lisa, could you kind of give me some guidance as to what you think timing wise and Dave? Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, Lisa. <laughs> Sorry, I was just gonna say, I've been monitoring the chat throughout the event and we haven't received um, any questions for the panel. Um, so I don't know if that influences how much time we want to dedicate to that. Um, but yeah, that, no, no questions so far in the chat. Okay. What were you going to say, Dave? I think we've got space. People aren't leaving, you know. I think we've got space for a discussion of some sort and then maybe maybe quickly on to Alan. Certainly, Alan, I'd love Alan's poem to be included. Oh, no, definitely. Um, we, won't, we won't miss um, Alan Rigg's poem. And we, we do have a letter from Ilhan Tromak to finish with as well, a short letter. So perhaps we could have Alan's poem and then Ilhan's letter and then see if there's any questions or if, if, if anybody would like to continue with the plenary then. I would I like also to read a letter that uh, the Netherlands <laughs> received from Nedim um, Turfent. 
Yes, apologies. Um, I, I, I got notification of that and we would like to have that read um, alongside um, Caroline when she reads, um, once she's read Ilhan's um, letter. So that would be that would be wonderful. I think that means then we need to go to Alan Reich and um, hear his poem. Um, sure. And uh, is that okay? I'll give Alan a brief introduction if that's okay. Please do, please do. Thank you very much. Not at all, thank you. So Alan is a, a leading uh, Scottish poet and is also professor of Scottish literature at Glasgow University. Uh, many collections and one of them which he co-edited is Lion's Milk, uh, Turkish Poems by Scottish Writers. Over to you, Alan. Okay, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Caroline. Thank it's, been a, it's been a very um, moving and tiring afternoon listening to all these stories which are heartening but also terrible. And one of the things that I, I'll, I'll be very brief and I'll simply read the poem, but I just two things I wanted to say. One was that I was really um, thought it was a really important point when Lisa was reading Osman Kavala's statement and the point was made that literature is not enough. That the kind of imagination that allows us to sympathize and empathize and free ourselves is absolutely essential and it's what we do and what we try to help happen, but it's not enough. And the work of lawyers and the work of the work that we do to push on the other doors to try and bring things about in actuality so that, as you've said, we see people when they come out of the jail and we're with them in the streets and in cafes and restaurants and bars and in conversation. The reality of that is the other side and mutually part of the same story is what happens with the imagination and the, the sympathy. The poem, just to, to emphasize that point, one of the poets, the, the, the wee anthology that I put together called Lion's Milk, um, Aslan Sutu, uh, tur uh, Scot uh, Turkish Poems by Scottish Poets, includes some pretty good writers. Edwin Morgan has a, has a fantastic little poem about Istanbul, Liz Lockhead. But I was reminded of Eddie Morgan's poem um, where he's referring to Byron and the prisoner of Chillon, and the sonnet on Chillon. And what he says is this, anyone who says chained Steve Biko's mind was chainless underwrites tyranny. Bonivard had it easy, a damp vault six feet above lake level, dayless gloom is really a spacious and rather airy vaulted room. Come on, I love you Byron, but that won't do. So what Morgan is doing in the poem is saying you cannot you cannot you cannot just let it go at that to, to praise the imagination. You have to also understand the reality of what's going on with all of these people that we're talking about, trying to sympathize with, understand. The poem I Dave Manderson um, invited me to uh, participate. I'm very grateful to you for doing that. I'm glad to be here. Um, I uh, was looking on the website to read something more about uh, Ilhan Sami Chomak and I've never met him and I, I, I had never met him until now, Caroline Stockford, his translator, but I was reading on the website and the first thing that I read was a particular poem which immediately went so far in that I, I, it stayed with me. The English poet John Dryden way back centuries ago said there are really three kinds of translation. One is a literal, um, a kind of just a metaphrase, a literal translation word by word. The other is a kind of paraphrase where you sympathize and you do a little bit of um, your own investment. And the third is a kind of imitation where you're moving from the original poem through whatever medium it comes to you in like a literal translation or a straightforward translation. And you're trying to do something a little more with it, with all acknowledgement to where it's come from and to bring it into your own imagination and your own world so that when it comes out, when it goes out, it is published with that acknowledgement there, then the original poet, the translator, and what you do with it yourself uh, expands it and opens it out to perhaps hopefully a, a, an even wider readership. And that's what I've tried to do. So I'll simply read the poem. 
have called it in praise of flying. Within the bare walls of my bare prison cell, the empty air encloses my body. I give thanks I've been held in the arms of good women. There are bars on the windows, locks on the doors, but outside the wind can be heard in the currents of air. And an atlas falls open, its pages turn over with all the world's oceans and lands to be seen. These are the wings of my mind, opening, closing, turning the air as I fly over continents, seas, in all their bright blues and long greens. And a light like a bird on a mountain top in an open field upon the rising waves of a tide on the branch of a tree looking over a forest these places and lives and my mind in connection are real a ladder on a tree trunk rising in the sky above others an ascent on a staircase cut in the air, carved in the rock. To the highest pinnacles there, on the heights of the world, of all life. Birds can fly without effort, but they always feel hunger. They can tire and come down, and some die on the wing. The wood of the window frame creaks with its age. My eyelids open and close and are weary, but I want to see more. As the currents of air in the wind curve around all the world and through time, and birdsong persists and the oceans of time Hold my childhood. Those days when I read all the stories and maps and believed them. And running, I slipped and fell over and slid on the gravel, scraping my knees and the palms of my hands till they bled. And that pain in my bare prison cell, I remember through all things between the skies, seas, and earth, the constant replenishing rain, its returning, its gift of reminding us all the brightness, its improvisation, experimentation, what changes things. As a bird will fly in the turning wind and find new seas and lands to light on, land on, take off from again. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alan. Okay. Um, it's now 10 to 6, so I think what we'll do is um, I would just like a quick thanks to um, particular people and then I'll hand over to um, Penn Netherlands to hear um, the message um, from Nedham and then we will end, uh, won't come back to me, we'll end with... Um, Caroline's message from Ilhan and um, Caroline, Caroline will read uh, Ilhan's um, words as, as the leaving, um, as the ending really. Um, so just, just before I hand over to Penn Netherlands, um, I really need to thank um, 
Baruch Altantash, Gurkan Aus Turin, and Epek Auzel, um, particularly for the fact that you're three hours ahead um, and you have stayed with us till way late into your evening. And thank you so much for your contributions. And particularly, it means so much to us because as Caroline says, you are in that country and you are, you are in the, the midst of it all. And um, so thank you for, for bringing um, your expertise and understanding of what's happening at the moment here. Um, I'd like to thank Luca Pacci and James Robertson, Mena Elvin and Alan Reich. Um, thank you to Dave for managing to um, pick up with um, Al Ame Alton's work. Um, thanks so much for that, Dave. Um, and I'd like to thank Ellen Half Griffith Jones as well. To Lisa Clark for her enormous work and the penning of the member's letter, and Ricky Monaghan Brown for the official Penn Centre letter. And finally, a very special thanks um, to Caroline Stockford, without whom this event would not have um, been able to, to happen. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I would like to um, move over to Penn um, Netherlands just to hear the message. Do you hear me? Yes, we yeah. hear lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, organizing this meeting. I think it's uh, very valued for us uh, because we still feel that we are in a bubble and in a way we can connect. We know last week that we had a PEN Congress, a Yeti Congress. We were not able to meet. We were able to talk to each other, to look at each other, but not for all. I would just read the message that we got from uh, Nadim Tufant, um, I think a month ago. It was, it took a couple of months to come to us. And we as Pan Netherlands um, try every first Monday of the month to activate our members to write to certain people. And in order to keep that spirit up, you need good messages. You need a way of energizing them. And to get a letter back from the prison is very important. So I shared this with them in order to put some energy on our members, but also because I think uh, that these people as you did this afternoon are more than prisoners. They're also authors, journalists, everything. Their words needs to be repeated and come to the world. So the, the, the letter, it's a very small postcard and my heart beat it a lot when I opened it. It says, to Penn Netherlands and dearest Penn friends, in all likelihood, people become more aware of the unique importance and meaning of solidarity when they are in need of it. Maybe. This sentence leaves no space for debate. Maybe not. In all ways, your message is of vital sense for me. Your words are the mother and spring of hope for my world. None of the words can explain my emotions, just as I receive your letter. Please, let me to thank you through a handful of words. As long as your solidarity is there, there is no other choice for pens like me, apart from speaking freely. Yours, Nadem. And I think this is a wonderful way as part of the ending of your wonderful webinar. Thanks a lot for hosting all of us. Thank you. That's beautiful. Yes, thank you very much for sharing that message from Nedim with us. And it is, it is inspirational to read Ilhan's poems, I would like to add, and Nedim's indeed. And Nedim will have a whole book of poetry in Turkish, which Barış Altantash has been organising. And I think somebody in pen is translating. Um, Ilhan, Ilhan's poems are now being read in New Zealand and I had a response, a, a poem for Nedim from New Zealand yesterday, which we will be sending to him. And I just think it's so powerful that, that poetry can absolutely slice through all of that persecution, through the walls, through the prison. It's still allowed in and out and it's still something people are somewhat afraid of because of its power and it really is powerful. And so I would, I would like to thank 
everybody for, for tuning in and, and coming to our event this evening. Thank you very much. Um, I do hope, as, as Ipek said, that Ilhan can feel our solidarity and they can feel it in, obviously in the letters you write to them. So um, I would echo everybody's uh, requests that you, that you do engage and write. And let us finish with, with Ilhan's words. And, and at the end of one of his poems, he said, there, um, there is no direction here, but there is a way out, always a way out. And I'll finish with his letter, which we received uh, on a, a WhatsApp message from, from Ipek because she recorded it uh, when he called uh, last week or so. <clears throat> Dear friends, miracles can be a little mean and they're fond of taking their time. They expect us to make pure and well-intentioned efforts as well as to have unwavering persistence in order to make them come true. However, sometimes as in my case, even all these efforts might not be sufficient. Miracles depend on the solidarity of kindness from people in order to combat the vastness of evil. After all these years of challenging conditions, of imprisonment, perhaps it would not be wrong to consider the fact that because my voice is heard and reaches you in echoes, a miracle has happened. In the desert of death I have been confined to for many years, I'm trying to reach life through literature and poetry. You have seen me and held my hand. You have acknowledged me and my writing. I thank you. Dear friends, all over the world, there are many writers held in prison unjustly. Some have been tested with oblivion for nearly 30 years like me, while some others for shorter periods of time. The lack of solidarity as well as repressive conditions curtailing their creativity, incarcerated writers face a wide open nothingness. We do not know the names of the works or the works of most of them, or what and how much was taken away from their life with the strange sword we call the legal system. But I know one thing. We try to create a point of resistance and forge a bond with freedom as we write and with life as we are silently oppressed by evil, the legal system and this silence. We have to write because we want to confirm that we exist and prison is made more bearable by writing. Not being forgotten is a good motivator. Please do not forget that any small step from you, writer friends on the outside is a beacon of hope for us in this pitch dark nothingness because what matters is people and literature that del delicate rose of life. Therefore, I wanted to share my joy with you because you put me on your agenda today, representing writers in prison. I'm aware of the responsibility this brings me. I would like to thank you in the name of all writers in prison and I wish you success in all your efforts for pen. With love, Ilhan Sami Chomak. Thank you very much. And we will now be displaying the names and addresses of, the, of these four imprisoned writers on the screen so that um, you may write them down and enter into communication with them. Thank you very much indeed for attending our event on the day of the imprisoned writer, November 2020.
Okay, thanks everyone.